Ace Combat 7 is a game that is utter wish fulfillment for me. I've always wanted to be a pilot. I've always wanted to soar above the clouds and have complete and utter freedom of movement. There's something magic about being 30,000 feet in the air, tickling the lower edge of the stratosphere, and looking down at the world laid out in front of you, nothing blocking your view of the horizon. But we're here to talk about the game. For many of you, the only real connection you'll have to the sky is probably in your dreams or in movies. You might recognize jets such as the F-14 Topcat that was in Top Gun from 1986, or the F-18 Hornet that was in Independence Day from 1996. Planes are kind of cool, you might tell yourself, and get roped into buying this game on a whim. That's mostly my story, despite always wanting to fly. I never thought about planes much, and I never played an Ace Combat game. But this game will sell you on some jets, and it will sell you on the concept of freedom and flight. Right from the get-go, you're met with a cutscene about a woman who has been working on beat-up junker jets with her grandfather for the past 10 years. She comes across as honest and passionate about what she does. As she finishes her jet repairs, she finally takes to the sky only to be shot down by passing jets in a war that has just suddenly broken out. Immediately, you're taken from her perspective to the seat of a man who is only referred to by his call sign, Trigger. You're in the war room. You are a fresh pilot. Suddenly, your base is being bombed. Scramble the jets. It's time to learn how to fly. This before mission briefing style is very akin to something like Metal Gear Solid or Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. It's very much an acquired taste that you might have to go through several times to understand. But because of that, it's got the same depth that you can sink your teeth into. The immediate politics and war games talk is a little confusing, but sets a mood that will carry on through the game. If you can't get into it and differentiate who is who and why their motivations overlap or conflict, then you're gonna be left behind. It doesn't wait. The game's story seems at first like it would have nationalistic undertones or have some sort of political agenda to push, but instead shows respect for people hailing from nations that are analogs to real life ones, meanwhile condemns things that are more obvious while acknowledging that they exist. Convicted conscriptional soldiers, prisoners of war, friendly fire, civilian casualties, political warfare, nuclear options that serve to hold back humanity as a whole. Etc. These are the things that you see in every major fiction about war. Japanese games in particular tend to have one single message. The nuclear option doesn't work. There's a ton of room for human error. And if you try to automate it, or put it out of human hands, it becomes its own singular force of destruction that doesn't care who's left or how things have changed. The risks aren't worth it. Once you get to know the cast, you'll feel like you have a connection with them as an ace pilot, and this carries over into rivalries. You even start to believe in the human characteristics of the AI-controlled drones that are centric to the story. This is rooted in the very solid sense of competition that the game has. It does a very good job of encouraging you when you do well, or admonishing you when you perform poorly. The game wants you to get better, and it will constantly remind you of this. From the start, it takes a gentle approach, and lets you learn over the course of a couple missions how to get a hold of your jet. Starting on the third mission of the game, it opens with a happy-go-lucky feeling that quickly takes the training wheels off, and sets a menacing tone to show just how much power your enemy really has, and gives you this hopeless feeling. You're now in the middle of a large-scale battle with chaos management. You're gonna have a bunch of things happening all at once. Always jets on radar. Always AA shooting at you from the ground. Always someone trying to light a fire in your tailpipe. Meanwhile, you have to pursue, engage, and tangle with a mess of assorted targets in a very tight time range. This is especially true on harder difficulties, where enemies are smart enough to know what button their flares are and how to perform high G turns. Speaking of high G turns and missile locks, the game's sound design is pretty spot on from what I would expect. If you can't handle people talking over each other on the radio, the mix of warning alarms, explosions, and jet engines, it can be a lot to take in. But once you're in the right headspace, it all comes together. Contrasting this is a sweeping and grand soundtrack that shouts, this is your chance, and is appropriately tense as situations change. When combined, you have a mix of auditory babble that puts you in the moment every step of the way. The entire story is told through voice acting, which can sound a little samey sometimes, but the important characters really stick out and become memorable. Though, in niche games like this, the game's translation always seems slightly off. Like, the thoughts get across, but not in a super cohesive way. Visually, the game is pushing for realism. Some planes are entirely fictional, but still look mostly believable. The game features a good amount of jets, and all the detail made me fall in love with the planes themselves. The cutscenes are mostly concise, and serve as a good moment to collect yourself. There is one probably unintentional hilarious moment of a 2D image of a dog. 
the visual design isn't really a huge selling point, but the game looks crisp and clean and runs decent. All you need to know is that the weather effects against the windshield, clouds in the distance, and realistic rendering is all very pretty. The hangar reminds me a lot of Armored Core or Gun Griffin, where you choose which plane you want to fly and which parts and weapons you want to bring with you. I do feel that you should be able to bring any special weapon on any plane, especially since you can put any regular upgrade part on any plane. As it is, it serves mostly as unneeded balance and to pad out the branching paths of the upgrade tree a bit, but like I said, I love it overall and it's very conducive to the trial and error replay value environment the game is going for. After having to do a script rewrite, I ended up getting an S rank on a mission I was having a very hard time with and absolutely trashing my high score. This feeling is as old as gaming itself, but it still has value. To start with, I'll say you should play this game on hard. It's a little easy otherwise, and this game shines best when it's challenging and when you're learning. There are refueling, resupplying, and landing sequences that are very engaging, but are skippable. I feel like being able to skip them takes something neat away from the game, and I highly urge you to experience them as part of the whole. It's okay to fail. It's okay to screw up and have some trial and error. It's okay to learn. The option is there if you want to skip these or lower the game's difficulty, but I beg you, I really beg you not to. You'll feel so much more rewarded by the end of it. Missions themselves feel long, even though they're only 20 to 30 minute stretches and are varied enough that each one feels unique. Missions become chaotic, and the game's narrative knows how to use this chaos to drive the plot. Each mission has another test of your skill, and under this series of constant tests, you make it out a better pilot, as you constantly fighting weather like sandstorms, thunderstorms, thick cloud coverage, or just regular turbulence. You're tasked with downing warboats, bases, fuel depots, ace pilots, and inhumanly precise drones based on ace pilots. Sometimes have to identify friend from foe before you fire, recover from your plane stalling while close to the ground, flying through gaps in radar or spotlight coverage, this all happens in the mix of crazy terrain. Eventually, you get good at managing the chaos of a battle in 3D space. Doing it all in your head becomes part of the thrill of it. There's nothing like hitting the air brakes in Mach 2, whipping around and perfectly lining yourself up while inverted, fighting the strong winds of a storm, barely skirting paths as missiles or guns connect and your target explodes in your face. This will be a good story to tell my son. You can't find this feeling in any other game. The amount of patience and concentration it takes to do this reliably is highly laudable. At the end of the game, you're given an almost insurmountable feat on paper. Fly into an extremely tiny underwater highway tunnel, turn in that tiny space, fly through tiny holes at 400 kilometers per hour, fly and take down targets in an extremely tight circle under a time limit, and then dangle your way up a space elevator's windbreak by flying straight up with obstacles in the way. It can be a little anticlimactic to fail this over and over, but it's supremely tense. And once you accomplish it, there's no feeling like it. This feeling is a perfect place to end the game on. I want to talk about the controller I saw and bought that was advertised with this game very briefly before I conclude this video. The Thrustmaster T-Flight HOTUS-1. This thing was difficult to set up and learn. The layout seems very strange. You have to take your hands off the controller to pause or hit other buttons, and with the paired optional pedals, you have three different things that control the rudders for some reason. It could do with adjustable weights, or just more weight in general. It's three set of wires, easily get in the way of things. Throttle is a little too easy to push, and we'll fall completely over with a little nudge, and the stick itself has no dead zone options. The rudder pedals don't have a lock for its three axes, and accidental inputs are very possible. Menus don't change if the game knows you're using the flight stick, so the menus take learning. Almost no conventions were made to make this easier to use. I'm not sure if I want to blame the devs of Ace Combat for this, or the devs of the flight stick. Once you get used to its flaws, it makes a very immersive and precise tool for flight, but I believe if you have a normal controller laying around, you can achieve roughly the same results. This thing's for the diehard fans. You can skip it. Let me conclude things. When you finish a mission that is intense, mentally demanding, and requires a lot out of you, and you're left drifting in the open air with your wits slowly coming back to you, there's something about staring into that deep, dark blue. There's a magic here that can't be matched by space flight sims or other flight sims. There's something special that only Ace Combat does, and it's hard to quantify or put into words. It's something you have to do for yourself, a state of mind 
you have to be here to experience. This game is full price at $60 on Steam, which is admittedly pretty hefty. If you aren't a romantic and don't feel the burning desire to fly like I do, it took me 14 hours to beat on hard, but this is my second time through and I've got 60 hours on it at the moment. For me, this was worth every penny. And I'm hoping that I've sold some of you on the idea that Ace Combat 7 gives you an unparalleled sense of challenge and freedom in equal measure. A lot of you were saying how uh, you wanted me to review a game that I'm passionate about. I really hope it's apparent just how much I love games like Ace Combat 7. Sure, it's not for everybody, it has a few tiny drawbacks, but I'm here to review things and be unbiased about them. I want to open people's eyes up to something unique and special, but also stay grounded about it. I don't want to sugarcoat stuff, and I don't want to endlessly talk things down for the sake of it. I want to give you an honest opinion without fitting any kind of mold and without giving it an out of 10 rating. I hope that you can appreciate that, and that you'll continue to watch from here on out. I'd appreciate it if you can all let me know what you think about this approach, what you thought about the review, and what you'd like to see me change or do better in the future. I'm still definitely taking review suggestions, and thank you for watching.